Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to continue talking about CFD here as applied to the lid-driven cavity flow. Uh, we're going to introduce um, the lid-driven cavity flow a bit, and then we're going to review the stencil for boundary conditions, or I guess we're going to derive the stencil for the boundary conditions. Last time we really just talked about how to, how to, um, how to advance the central difference nodes. And then we're going to apply that to the lid-driven cavity flow, and then we're going to talk about the solution a bit. So here's an example of a lid-driven cavity flow. It's pretty easy to set up, which is why it's a canonical problem, um, or one of the reasons. So uh, here's a flow moving over this solid wall here. Here's a wall, and there's a hole here or a cavity with base and height. And then depending on this ratio of base to height, you can get a lot of different phenomena that occurs. Like you can get uh, a swirling flow here. You can see that the flow appears to swirl. Or on the left, you can have this large stagnation region. Um, and so what height might that, that stagnation region uh, manifest itself? Here's an example of, uh, again, a, a flow that's swirling, but for a given base height, base height ratio, you might develop secondary flow. So it's not a single swirl, but maybe there's a swirl here, and then some secondary swirls off to the side. So very rich in its behavior. Um, a lot of linear flows, or I should say a lot of laminar flows, but a lot of transition in laminar flows. So it makes it a great problem to study numerically because you would want to know, well, is my scheme accurate enough or is it good enough to, to, to uh, predict these transitions? But the base, the base flow, you would imagine this kind of flow here, you would probably be able to derive an analytic solution for that, like what we would do in transport phenomena or something. All right, so here's the basic geometry. In lid-driven cavity I would just flow, play a little the top video. surface of a fluid-filled box is driven at constant linear velocity, while the other five surfaces are kept still. In this video, you can see the transient behavior of the system once the lid is actuated. Notice that flow proceeds along the top surface and then impacts the right wall, creating a downward turbulent jet that eventually recirculates with the driving lid. In the last fast-forwarded clip, notice that the center is very circular with regions of turbulence at the corners. Also note that, although the top is slightly dimmer, this is only due to lighting constraints. All right, so that's a video, and I mean, it's not great because that looks like a turbulent flow to me. I mean, look at all those variation you see in here, right? But it's just something so you can visualize the flow. All right, so this is our computational domain. We've got this XY coordinate system, that's our real coordinate, so to speak, and then we've got our IJ coordinate system, which is our integer system. So I and J are related to X and Y with the grid, basically, right? One is mapped onto the other. So my grid is going to look something like this. I'm going to call the uh, lower left-hand corner the origin, and so that'll be my I equals zero, J equals zero. I'm going to use Fortran, and in Fortran you can have array indices that start with zero. And then I'm going to have 64 nodes, so total of 65, really, if it's 0 up to 64, that's 65. So the, uh, in the far right-hand corner, that'll be J equals 64, I equals 64. We've got all our central difference nodes in there, so I should have 63 central difference nodes in the X and uh, Y or IJ directions. So let's talk about the boundary conditions. What do we do? So uh, this is the conservation of, uh, of mass, basically. That's mass conservation. And uh, one of the things that we're doing, one of the things that's great about the McCormick scheme, which uh, I, when I tried this problem as a grad student, or I was assigned this problem as a grad student, something very similar, I didn't uh, use the McCormick scheme. And I used a scheme that, uh, that was basically a truly incompressible scheme that assumed density was zero. And that was a hard scheme. To, to implement because with the density being zero or constant, it means that uh, waves or disturbances are infinitely fast. And if you have infinitely fast disturbances, then uh, it's kind of an unstable flow. So um, just based on the current stability criteria. So there were some other tricks we had to do, some physical slash non-physical tricks to make the, the, the solution work. And eventually, I got it to work and everything is fine, but it was cumbersome, right? What's nice about the McCormick scheme is it just says, okay, we're going we're gonna to truly approximate these fluctuations in density. So you can see this is just continuity. 
but uh, assuming that at the left wall, so we're just looking at this at the left wall, we're going to apply no slip, that there's no gradients in density along the y direction. So that seems like a reasonable assumption. Um, you don't have to apply this. You could allow there to be gradients and you could solve it. It's just a simplification and people have found this simplification works. Um, and you don't have to do any of this, right? You could come up with your own schemes and so forth and, and uh, discretize in your own way and maybe someone would name the scheme after you if it worked well. But McCormick did this and uh, so we're just following along with what he did. So the density fluctuates. There is no dependency along the boundaries uh, uh, of the of the boundary condition, but there is a we are getting information from two nodes away from the central node. See what we're doing here? In this predictor step, we're using the ij, and in this case, that is on the boundary. So that's the the end that's the end time of what rho u is on the boundary. And then we're using information at i plus 1 and at i plus 2. So we're using two nodes away, right, to, to calculate our prediction for what the density is at the wall. This is really essentially central difference because in central difference, we used the node left and right of the node we were calculating. So that made it second order accurate. Here we're maintaining second order accuracy in our boundary condition by using two nodes away but in the same direction. So some people call this upwind or downwind schemes, or uh, you can see why they might call it that, looking in a particular direction rather than central difference scheme. So this is for the predictor, and the same happens in the corrector. We're still using information at ij, just at the intermediate step, and then intermediate information at i plus 1, and intermediate information at i plus 2. So, uh, this is some averaging of the two densities to predict the full time step density at rho n plus 1. Now, because this is no slip where u and v are 0, then the momentums would be uh, rho u at star is equal to 0 and rho u at n plus 1 is equal to 0. So pretty easy to implement. So that would be the, the, the left wall. And then the right wall. You don't have information at anything higher than i, like i plus 1 and i plus 2 at the right wall. So really, uh, you have to use information only within the domain. So uh, here, i would be 64. And so you're going to use information at i minus 2 and at i minus 1 to keep you in the domain. So that's a downwind scheme. And then uh, you're using information at i and j there. And th then the same thing happens. At the intermediate steps, you're using i and j. And i minus 1, i minus 2. And because it's no slip, u and v are 0. So rho u, rho v are 0. That makes a lot of sense. Now on the floor, uh, at y is equal to 0, we're going to again assume that there's no dependency uh, on x. This should say no x dependency in the stencil. Just uh, you're assuming that derivatives in the x direction are 0. You're just going to look at derivatives in the y direction. So you're going to get information to solve for uh, i and j, that's on the floor, and really j here should be equal to 0 for my stencil or for my grid. Um, then I'm going to use information at j plus 1 and at j plus 2, so second order accurate upwinding scheme for uh, the predictor step and then the same for the corrector step to keep them both second order accurate. And then no slip again means all the momentums are 0. Finally, we get the lid, and the lid now is moving. So it's no slip because the, we're assuming that the fluid is stuck to the lid, but it doesn't mean all the momentums will be zero, right? So here we're going to impose that uh, rho u, the momentum at star, is equal to rho at uh, star ij, and we're going to get rho at star here times u. So we can calculate this explicitly. First, we would calculate our new densities, which is a downwind scheme looking at in the down j direction. And now we're going to include the x dependency derivative. So we'll look left and right. So that'll be our second order. And then uh, we'll, again, resolve the derivatives in the y direction using this um, downwinding scheme in y. And then we'll use central difference in x. Then we'll use this information to, def to, to directly solve for the change in density along the lid. So I hope that makes sense. Maybe you should try this out. I mean, just 
have a good look at it to see if it makes sense to you. All right, so from here we're ready to code it up. And a lot of coding and a lot of mistakes and then something that works, right? So the first thing we would do is converge the mesh. So I'm going to change the number of nodes that I use in the mesh. What I showed you before is 64 by 64, but what if I used 10 by 10? If I use 10 by 10, I would take using a current stability of a half, uh, I take a, a 100,000 steps on my Mac laptop. It takes about seven seconds to do that calculation in Fortran. And this is the solution I would get. These lines here represent uh, uh, streamlines. So you got solid or straight streamlines representing the lid. And then you can see the streamlines associated with the, uh, the recirculating flow driven by the lid. Now, when I increase the resolution to 64 by 64, suddenly I see that this flow should have had, um, it should have had uh, recirculation in the corners or a secondary flow, which wasn't resolved uh, in the coarse mesh, right? So that's not a, it's not like new physics happened. It means that the mesh was so coarse that it just wasn't able to resolve this fineness, right? Because really, if you look at it, if I resolve this with just 10 nodes in this direction, or 11, because it's zero relative, then really it's, all of the action is right in there with this secondary flow. It's just, there's just not enough resolution there in the mesh to resolve that secondary flow. If I go up to 256 by 256, <clears throat> starting to take a long time, right? Like this took seven seconds, this took almost three minutes, this has taken an hour and, a, and 15 minutes to do 256 by 256, it doesn't look like the mesh has changed much. I got a nice clear picture. It's not as fuzzy as this, this uh, 64 by 64, but um, it uh, doesn't look to be changing, but it, it is resolving it a, a bit nicer. So uh, if you want to see more about secondary flows, go look at that National Committee on Fluid Mechanics film. I love those things. There's one on secondary flows. And if you wanted to plot this as a streamline, I'm using, this is how I'm, I'm doing it in MATLAB. So it's helpful to, uh, to know how to take <clears throat> a, a mesh and then plot streamlines based on that mesh. All right, <clears throat> so we converge the mesh. Oh, well, that's a terrible looking image. It's supposed to be the recirculating flow, but Microsoft and its wisdom has changed the resolution for me. Thank you, Microsoft. So if I took a slice <clears throat> and just plotted what the velocity profile is in that slice from 0 to 1, so this is in the real, uh, this is in real coordinates, whereas the previous one I was showing you in integer coordinates, then the velocity would look something like that right there. Here's what the velocity profile, so this is velocity down here, and this is uh, y, sorry, not x, in the center at, uh, at x equals 0 or x equals 1 half of the total domain. So you can see it's quite a big change in what the velocity looks like. And then for the 256 by 256, uh, it looks pretty similar, but is it worth the extra hour uh, of computational time to get that solution? That's up to you. But it is converging the mesh, right? So I would keep changing the resolution until the mesh, or until the solution didn't change. And when I did that, it's called converging the mesh. We'd also need to converge in time. How do I know I've reached the final steady state solution? Well, one way to do it is calculate a residual, some indicator as to what the overall solution is. So I decided to calculate the residual by looking at what is rho at n plus 1 minus rho at n. So this is how much is every rho changing in the domain, and sum up all of those changes, or the absolute value of all those changes. And you would think that when I get to the steady state solution, that would be zero, right? That sum would be zero because rho isn't changing. So we're going to call that difference the residual. So if I plotted the residual over, it, in, uh, over iterations, here's, what is this, uh, 100,000 iterations, then uh, you can see for the 10 by 10 mesh, really, the residual just becomes a constant number. Maybe it'll never be zero, but it's a constant number uh, rather quickly iteration-wise. 
for the 64 by 64, it took a few seconds for it to converge. And then for the 256 by 256, it seems like it's converging slower, but eventually gets there. So if I plotted computational domain size versus uh, the number of how much time it took, you can see that it's exponentially increasing. This is linear on the x-axis and log on the y-axis. So it's, it's, that is the way of life. Time is money, and the computational time, or the wall clock time, goes exponentially up as a function of the domain size. So you, it's not free here, right? And it's also even worse because uh, as the resolution increases, as delta x gets smaller, it's driving delta t small, right? So this is part of why it's exponential, is that both of these things are happening at the same time. Here's a video of what the solution looks like. Remember, this is a time-accurate video. Unlike the inviscid solutions that we did earlier, those were not time-accurate. These are time-accurate because we're resolving that time derivative, right? We've got that delta by delta t in there. So there it is, 25,000 steps. It looks like it's converged for the 64 by 64. It's hard to see down here the recirculating flow because I'm plotting only every tenth node because if I plotted them all it would be it would be too busy you wouldn't be able to see it so this is the this is the command I use to generate this movie if you want to learn a little bit about Linux commands here's the 64 by 64 here's every node so you can kind of see what it looks like now that you know what it looks like it's obvious what's happening the arrowheads kind of work their way down into the flow field kind of make it look darker because of the arrowheads. But it eventually converges. It's still hard to see this region down here, what's happening. So I'll blow that up. And we'll have a look at that secondary flow. That's a terrible image here. Again, it's just because what MATLAB, uh, sorry, what PowerPoint did to my image. But you can see the development of the secondary flow. The arrows are actually going in the opposite direction. Then I could connect those arrows that vector field with a streamline if I wanted to. Looks like that. So here they are superimposed. This is right out of the book. This is out of Kundu's book. All of this is out of Kundu's book. This is his solution for uh, the McCormick scheme for different two different Reynolds numbers. I only looked at the 400 Reynolds number, so it's the one on the right there. If I lay my solution over it, it looks like Kundu and I agree on uh, what that solution should be. There's a higher resolution or more, more resolution image of it. So uh, that's it. That is the solution here. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time.